So this is just a brief overview of what I'm hoping to cover today, um, starting with some brief sections on environment and handling. Uh, after that, I'd like to focus the bulk of the presentation on storage supports and condition red flags. Um, care of objects is a pretty big topic that could go in a lot of different directions, so I really encourage you to ask questions as we go. Um, I do have a little bit of a tendency to be easily sidetracked, so in the interest of keeping me on track, um, I like to save questions for the end, but please type them as you think of them, and then I'll, I'll address all of them. I have about an hour of um, kind of prepared presentation, and then we can go from there. Um, I, uh, I'll do my best to answer questions. I may have to uh, get back to you later um, with more information. And if you don't want to ask your questions right now, my email will be on the last slide, so you can email me directly if, if that's more comfortable for you. Okay, before we get started, I wanted to throw this slide in there just to be... Um, for clarification, because the term objects in a collection setting can be confusing. Sometimes it's also applied to paper-based art and documents, paintings, textiles, etc. Um, and that's that's not how I'm going to be using it today. So when I'm talking about objects today, I'm talking about three-dimensional collections generally viewed in the round. So um, if you think about a watercolor on paper, um, it has a front and the back. It might have watercolors on both sides, and um, even though they share a physical support um, in terms of content, they have different identities. You know, they could be studied separately from a curatorial art historical perspective um, compared to something like a shoe, which also has a front and a back, but no matter what direction you view it from, it's still going to be the, the same shoe. So on screen I have some examples of objects. As, as you can see, there's quite an array of materials and forms. Um, plastic and snakeskin shoes, taxidermy specimens, um, cocoa powder in a metal tin. There's still cocoa powder in there, so edible collections. Um, a birch bark basket with moose hair embroidery, a metal and wood sewing machine, a glass vessel with a metal rod, um, a whole bunch of other materials that you can see there, um, including even sometimes paper. So on the far right, there's a paper mache lacquered vase, and that could easily end up on an object conservator's bench. Um, even though it's predominantly paper, its form and function are more like an object. Basically, all I'm trying to get at here is that we're going to be just exploring the tip of a very big iceberg. So um, to tackle all of this, I'm going to try and keep it pretty general. But what I'd like to do um, right now is just take a moment for everyone um, to maybe introduce yourselves. And then uh, if you would, wouldn't mind sharing a material or an object type that you have in your collection that you're maybe less comfortable with or just curious to know more about. Um, I can't guarantee, um, but I'll try and, and work some of those uh, types in as we go. Um, so while folks are thinking and typing, um, I would just like to mention that in order to get the most out of this time slot, because it is a big topic, I'm going to assume that everyone has uh, either has seen the other webinars in this series or, um, or is going to afterwards. Um, there's a lot of overlap in collections care across media and formats, so a lot of what has already been presented about photographs, paper, integrated pest management could easily be repeated for this webinar. Um, but I'm going to try and avoid that and focus in on more kind of object-specific concepts. So if, if we go through and, and you feel like there's some missing information, um, I encourage you to check out the webinar archive on um, CCAHA's website, which is uh, just ccaha.org. Ooh, legislative desks. Okay, furniture, yes. Um, and I will just say um, all of these objects on screen, um, they're often... Conser objects conservators who specialize in these. So there are like furniture and decorative arts conservators, glass conservators, natural history conservators. Um, I'm trained as a generalist, which means I know a very little bit about a lot of things. So if you have in-depth questions, um, I, I may not be able to answer them, but I can probably point you in the right direction. So Stuffed animals, yep. Farm equipment. 
All right. Okay. Well, keep typing, everyone. I'm going to move on to the next slide, um, but I will keep an eye on that chat box. Okay. So briefly, a note about the environment. Um, as you likely all are all already very familiar, um, the environment plays a very important role in the longevity of collections. Um, if your conditions are uncontrolled and unmonitored, damage can, can sneak up on you gradually. Um, You'll often see 50% relative humidity and 70 degrees Fahrenheit recommended for mixed collections. Um, that is a good rule of thumb, but just so that you are aware, if you have mis mixed collections, um, there's, there's really um, no way to please everything. Um, those moderate conditions are the best overlapping windows we have for so many different needs. I mean, as you saw, there's so many different um, possible materials. So as an example, um, I have on screen a uh, bronze on the left. And metals, in general, um, if it's not a composite object um, with other materials attached, are best stored in dry conditions, pretty much the the drier the better. But on the right hand side there's this mammoth molar that was exposed to very low relative humidity and that resulted in quite a lot of damage. Um, I, hopefully you can see it in these images but existing cracks widened, new cracks formed, um, and it can't see it so well here but pieces just started falling off and that's after one cycle and this will just get worse um, with fluctuations. So. If you have these two objects in the same storage space, you are going to have to make a compromise, and that's why stable and moderate is your best bet. Um, fluctuations, as I mentioned, are, are the worst, <laughs> so it's important to monitor your conditions um, and do what you can to, to soften those variations. Um, in this particular instance with the bronze and, and the molar, um, one option would be to use microenvironments, uh, maybe use a moisture scavenger for the bronze to bring the relative humidity down just like locally around that object. I hadn't really planned on going into that very much, but um, you know, throw a question in um, if, if you want to keep talking about that after, after we finish. Um, okay. So other parts of the environment include air quality and light. Um, these are covered in the previous webinars, so I'm not going to go into them too much. But if you are looking for material-specific environmental recommendations, um, I often turn to the CCI Notes series. That's the Canadian Conservation Institute, and also the National Park Service Museum Handbook. Um, the appendices of Part 1, which is the collection section of the handbook, go into quite a lot of detail for a number of, of different materials. Okay. So handling is another area where there's a lot of overlap. Um, it's covered, I know, in, in care of paper. But there is uh, one consideration that I'd like to highlight here um, because I, I think it might come up more often with objects, um, and that's handling restrictions. Um, and that can apply uh, to collections sometimes for your own safety or out of cultural respect. Um, natural history collections and organics and human history collections uh, often have pesticide residues on them depending on their collection history and where they've been living. Uh, so whatever system your institution uses to track hazardous collections, um, you want to um, check that first before handling so that you can take any uh, appropriate safety precautions. You, you may need to wear gloves for a material that you wouldn't otherwise, uh, wear a mask, an apron, and so forth. So this taxidermy oyster catcher um, tested positive, I think it was for arsenic, um, and so that's indicated by that eye-catching pink skull and crossbones tag. And then on the right, um, that's, just, uh, that's a close-up of, of arsenic on feathers. Um, there may also be um, cultural protocols, and so if an object is from a culture that um, you're not that familiar with, you're not sure what the object is or its cultural significance, you may want to double check um, before handling because some objects do have restrictions. As with and of all other collections, you want to be sure to adequately support the object during handling. Um, I kind of just assume that 
every object is like a baby, like it just can't hold up any of its own parts. Um, and many objects have very tempting handles and in design and use, those were meant to be handled. Um, that's why they're called handles. But in collections, those are generally weak points that should be avoided for handling. So the illustration on screen um, shows a suitcase with a nice enticing handle at the top, but if I were to carry this suitcase by the handle and then lose control of the object for whatever reason, um, you know, my hands have to travel the, the height of the suitcase plus the distance that the suitcase falls um, to recover the object. Um, unless I, I yank on the handle, which I don't recommend, that will probably break it, assuming that that's not the reason the object is falling in the first place. Um, and that's in comparison to the image on the right. If, um, if I'm supporting the suitcase from below and I lose control, I'm just much more likely to recover that object because my hands are already right there. Uh, basically, you just want to place your hands in a way that minimizes your chances of breaking the object and maximizes your chances of recovering the object. And that is usually underneath. So that brings me to this sad slide, which is that objects do get damaged. Um, handling is one of the most common ways, um, maybe the most common way, I'm, I don't know, but it's definitely up there um, as a way that objects get broken. And so that's why that mental checklist from before is really important, you know, just making sure that we actually do need to handle the object and that we're equipped to do so. Um, but even so, um, it still does happen. Um, as someone who has handled a lot of objects, I have broken an object. Um, I, I knocked it over onto the floor. And even though I was trained in object handling, I have to say my first instinct was to just like get on the floor and try to sweep it up. But at the last minute, uh, my training did, did kick in. And as distressing as it was for that object to be on the floor, when I um, took that moment to assess the situation, I found that the object wasn't in any immediate further danger. I was behind the scenes. Um, uh, you know, I wasn't in a public gallery where visitors might step on the object or, you know, try to intervene. Um, there were no liquid components that might seep or spill. Um, there was nothing kind of soft or plastic that might deform. So in this case, um, I had the luxury of, of documentation being able to, to take the time and document. So I went to tell my coworkers what had happened so that they were aware. And also um, they helped me calm down because I was freaking out. Um, and there wasn't uh, any conservation available that day. So we put caution tape around the object and began documenting. So I made annotated sketches. I took really detailed photographs. Um, I came up with a temporary numbering system so that the physical pieces could be matched to the images. Um, and when we later were able to take it to conservation, you know, all of that documentation helped in that treatment and just made it a much more uh, efficient process. Um, it's really important even for small incidents because it's it's not just for, for conservation. It can also be really important for insurance claims and it also, you know, like it or not, does become part of the object's interpretation for the rest for the rest of the object's life. Um, you know, if you have an object in your collection that's there because um, a famous person or someone really important to the mission of your collection owned it and they damaged it, then you might want to uh, to talk about that with visitors and um, you would want to document that and maybe preserve it, but you can't tell the difference unless you document um, any subsequent damage. So if you think about your own collections and maybe some objects that have damage, for me personally, I would rather know what happened. So. One way to reduce the chances of breaking an object during handling is to provide a storage support that can be handled instead of the object. Um, supports can also be beneficial um, by protecting objects from you know, light, pollutants, all those fluctuations in temperature and relative humidity that we talked about earlier. Um, a good support provides cushioning and supports all of those kind of appendages that I mentioned earlier. And um, in terms of material selection, um, those have been, been covered in previous webinars, um, but just be aware that objects have similar sensitivities. Um, most objects are sensitive to acids, which um, should be eliminated through the photographic activity test. Um, regarding 
buffered versus unbuffered papers. Leather and metals are both listed in the kind of unbuffered side, so just something to be aware of. Um, and also, uh, your objects might might have their own incompatibilities. I know that um, things like wool um, can off-gas sulfur, uh, which then can impact collections around them. So just thinking about chemical compatibility. And once you feel comfortable with that uh, that part, the rest of material selection um, is pretty, uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, is it is it a good texture? Is it strong enough? Is it cost effective? Which um, is usually a factor. So when you're picking a, a support or designing a custom support, also it's really important to keep in mind access. Um, the image on screen is a birch bark wallet um, that when it came in it was stored in this plastic bag and there was a specific request from the client not to increase the storage footprint at all because storage space was really tight which is a situation that we're probably all familiar with um, they didn't want a big padded box that was going to add an inch on every side they you know they wanted it to take up the same amount of space um, but because the bag is so close to the actual size of the object, every time the object had to come out or go back, um, the zip mechanism at the top um, could catch on the object and abrade that delicate surface. So all we did was add this little tray. It's folder weight, you know, acid-free, lignin-free paper, and it's sewn onto a piece of mat board um, that, to pull on. So the tray keeps the bag open enough as you're pulling that the zip doesn't contact the wallet. So that was one way to maintain the visual access, keep the small footprint, and then also reduce that physical risk. So always be thinking about um, you know, how this object is going to be accessed in the future. OK, so what I've done for this section is put together a few slides that highlight like some really common styles of supports that allow you to handle the support rather than the object. So trays, pallets, and boxes. Um, after that, I have a couple slides of, you know, kind of other more out there storage solutions that we can talk through and then just some general support building tips. Um, if this is an area that people are particularly interested in, we can talk, you know, at the end more about setting up a functional like workspace for support building. Um, almost all of the images in this section show supports made out of blue board. You might know it as gray board, but it's, it's basically high quality corrugated cardboard. You can also make most of these out of coroplast or if you have really light objects, paper. So um, these can be scaled up or down depending on what strength you need. Um, this section might be overwhelming or underwhelming depending on your experience with collection housing so I do encourage you to ask questions during this portion to get the most out of it and please uh, you know don't be embarrassed to ask for clarification um, support building requires a lot of spatial reasoning and so it's difficult for me anyway to communicate some of these concepts um, in this format where you can't see like all of my wild hand gestures so if you don't understand it's probably me not you um, a tray is exactly what it sounds like. It has a flat bottom and, and short sides, and it creates a natural buffer zone around the object, which is really nice. Um, I think a lot of people assume that building individual supports for every object will take up more space, and in some cases, uh, like if you have baskets stacked inside each other, that probably shouldn't be when you go to house them properly, you have to unstack them, and, and that would, of course, increase your storage footprint but in my experience, it's more often the opposite. Um, if you have a lot of objects sitting in a drawer, um, you don't want to put them too close to each other because they can kind of walk around when the drawer is open and closed. But if they all have trays, you can put them wall to wall without having to worry so much about them knocking into each other. Um, they might bump into the side of the tray, which I'll address in a second, but they're not going to hit each other or the sides of the drawer. Um, so you might find um, that you actually um, get objects closer together if they all have supports. Another advantage of trays and also boxes is that they catch fragments. So if you have objects that are prone to losing bits, I've put rock, uh, rock and mineral specimens on screen as an example, um, that the tray will keep all the pieces together and also keeps your storage furniture and any linings um, clean. 
Um, trays are pretty good maximizers of material uh, because they use this kind of rectangular pattern that's on screen where very little gets discarded. So this is just a kind of sample pattern and the the distance from the edges to the dotted lines represent the height of the tray walls and those corners um, become the anchoring tabs so you don't have to uh, cut anything off. One of the disadvantages of trays is that they don't offer much in the way of dust or light protection so they're best used in drawers and cabinets. Just a few more um, examples of trays. Um, if a tray gets too small, it can be hard to construct and also to access. So if you have a lot of small objects or skinny objects that would have, you know, at least one dimension would be really small, you might combine them in one tray. So on the left, um, that's just folded paper. You know, accordions are nice for long skinny objects as long as you don't make it too tight and turn it into a spring. Um, you can anchor the accordion in the bottom either with hot glue, not while the objects are in the tray, of course, um, or you can also, if you're using a blue board, you can sew it down. You can tack it down with thread. Um, on the right, there is a tray and pallet uh, combination. To improve access for an icon with fragile edges, the tray protects the edges, um, but it also means it's hard to get your fingers in there. So the icon sits on a pallet, has those two side tabs that stick out the side, and those slot into corresponding gaps in the tray wall so the, um, the icon can just be pulled straight up out of the tray. Um, it, these are just some tips if you're new to, to tray making. Um, they might seem straightforward, but I can tell you from experience that um, it's easy to fall into these traps sometimes. Um, so for example, when I first started making a lot of trays, I thought it would be best to use the least amount of material and make the smallest possible tray. But for an object like this cup in the illustration, um, and lots of objects are smaller at the base. So you can make a tiny tray and the object will go into it, um, but then you've destroyed that buffer zone that I was talking about. And as soon as you go to snug the objects up next to each other, they, they can hit each other. Um, so it's best, uh, there's the diagram on the right, which shows you know, making the tray as wide as the object to maintain that buffer zone. Um, also, trays are short, uh, so if you have a tall object like a basket, and we did talk about um, sliding around within the tray, um, you can add bumpers um, just to keep things in place, to keep um, these baskets from tipping out, for example. Let's see. Oh, yes, and the third point, um, annotating your support. It, it's really, it's easy to see how an object fits into a support when you're making it, um, but later when somebody has to remove that object, um, you know, for a researcher or for exhibition, and then they go to put it back in the support, um, you know, how obvious is it how the object goes back in? And if the answer is not very, um, you should include notes on the support. So that could be something as simple as writing front where the front of the object goes, or it could be like full instructions if it's complicated um, on how to undo and redo the support. Um, so I will just mention, sorry, I saw the question. Um, I've used generally ethafoam, which is a blocky polyethylene foam. I've also used mini cell, which is also polyethylene. And um, I will talk a little bit more about ethafoam uh, later on. So, okay. So pallets are just like trays without sides. Obviously this offers less physical protection, but it also uses less material and makes for a really customizable footprint. Um, it is possible to make trays in other shapes, but it's kind of a pain, so it's just much easier to do with a pallet. Um, the sides of the tray, in addition to protecting the sides, of your object, they also make the bottom sturdier to keep it from twisting and bending. So because pallets don't have that, they're not well suited for, for heavy objects. Um, and like trays, they're not ideal for open storage because they are themselves are very open. A few more examples of pallets. Um, because 
because there's no walls, you do have to include some way to keep the objects from sliding off the palette. Um, bumpers are really good for immobilizing kind of wiggly parts. But you can also use tie downs or even just a bag, which is what's um, for that bracelet. Um, that's just there's nothing um, connecting the palette to the object. Um, it's really just there kind of as a backer, supportive backer. Um, if the objects are light enough, you can put multiple objects on a palette, like these model snowshoes in the, on the right. Um, another option is to combine a tray and a palette to make a tiered tray. So along the bottom of the slide, there are two objects um, that go together. One is in the bottom of the tray with extra tall bumpers so that a palette can sit on top without touching the object below and you end up with this kind of like bunk bed situation where the second object um, has tie downs and is just placed on top. Um, with multiple objects on a support like this you do have to consider association. Um, it might not be appropriate for some objects to share a support but um, in these cases when they're sets um, it, you know we weren't we weren't too worried about that. They were already associated. So for getting started with palette building, um, like trays, if you want the palette to provide a no-fly zone, you have to make it larger than the object. It uh, works best if the board is flat because you're um, kind of relying on the thickness of the board to maintain that space. Um, and you might have some like bowed or warped blue board. You can still use that for trays and boxes, but I don't recommend it for palettes because um, it means that there are gaps under the palette and another palette can slide in there and then your objects can touch each other. Um, in the photo on the right, I think hopefully you can see um, that there's a palette coming in from the bottom of the image that has um, you know kind of jumped the curb of the palette next to it. And so it's actually on top of the neighboring palette. In this particular case, the edge of that palette has run into a bumper on the other palette. Um, you can't see it because it's underneath the spoon. Um, so it can't go any further, but um, you are in general trying to avoid this overlapping palette situation. Um, but the reason I actually included this image was for a good reason, and that was to um, show you how many more spoons we could fit in this drawer because um, palettes are so customizable. Um, tapered shapes like this can gain a lot of space using palettes versus trays. And um, of course, round shapes like spoons gain a lot from having a support. I'm sure you can imagine opening a drawer of unsupported spoons and they're all they're all wiggling. So um, if twill tape is too abrasive for the object, um, but you do want to use a tie down, there are ways around that. Um, I know it's white on white, so you may not be able to see it. But in the image on the left, there's a twill tape tie down that has a Volara foam sheath. Um, Valara is a, is a trade name um, for closed cell polyethylene foam sheet. It comes in different thicknesses, but if you can only stock one, I suggest eighth inch. Uh, just It's very versatile. So this seat belt um, on the left has a strip of Valara that's cut slightly wider than the twill tape, and then it has two slits cut perpendicular to the long direction um, that the twill tape can, can run through, and that keeps the Valara in place and between the twill tape and the object. Um, if you're short on time, you can just put a piece of Alara underneath and the, the tie down will hold it there. But um, you'll probably find that as the palette gets used, you know, you have to take the spoon out and then put it back in. With every use, um, that Valara piece is likelier and likelier to walk away. Uh, whereas if it's um, held in place, um, it's much more likely to stay with the support. Another option is to not use full tape at all, but to use uh, strips of Tyvek. You can also strengthen a palette by using two sheets um, you know, glued together with the corrugations perpendicular to each other. That helps reduce the bending and any uh, buckling or bowing. Um, you could also um, upgrade to Coroplast. So boxes, I know you guys are familiar with what boxes are. They're just all trays, um, and they have all the benefits of trays um, with the added bonus you know, of the, the extra protection. They offer dust and light protection, especially if you use a lid. Um, the flip side is that boxes uh, reduce 
access and also use more material. But um, it is nice. I know that some people mentioned um, that they have some some garments, um, some textiles, um, garment boxes. If they're not too full, can often be stacked because they're short and wide, um, and so that can that can save space. Uh, there are a few ways to help with the access issue. Um, so here's a few variations of boxes. The bowl on the left is hard to access in a box because of its height. Um, you could make the box a lot bigger um, to be able to get your hands in there, but that takes up more shelf space and you would still have to lift the object um, pretty high. You're generally trying to avoid that. You're trying to keep it kind of close to um, an object. I mean a surface and uh, so instead one wall can be untied from the rest of the box and open out um, like a drawbridge and this was um, in the care of photographs uh, webinar a very similar um, storage solution um, in this case the bowl has a pallet with a twill tape pull so that the pallet can be slid straight out and that gives you access from all sides now I've also seen people do this where all four sides open like a flower it's very pretty um, but I I don't for me personally, I don't love the amount of wiggle that that allows between the four sides, um, but it just it depends on on your preference. The box in the middle has uh, just a Tyvek sling underneath it to help begin the lifting process until you can get your hands underneath. Um, it's a it's a really nice simple solution, but it only works if the object can withstand a certain amount of tipping and isn't too big or heavy. So you have to have kind of a nice compact object. And the image on the right deals with visual access. So this box has a mylar window in it so that the object is visible in storage. And um, you know, it's kind of a, a toss up. You lose the, um, the light protection, but it is easier to monitor for things like pest infestation. And as you can see, this is a natural history uh, specimen where that might be particularly desirable. So a few tips to get you started on your box building. Um, <laughs> remember to start your box construction with the height because that measurement is what dictates how far from the edge of the blue board you need to be. So I've done this a lot of times where I realize I haven't left enough space um, for the walls. So um, in this diagram on the, on the left, um, the kind of four arms of the cross become the walls and then the center panel is the bottom. So the red lines are equal to the height that you want the box. And if you make a lid for a box, um, make sure that you trace the top of the box, not the bottom. Even though they are supposed to be the same dimensions, in theory, that is not usually how it works out. Um, labeling, yes. All your supports should be labeled, but it's extra important for boxes because of the reduced visual access. So the, um, in the image on the right, there's boxes on the top shelf, and so you can't see inside those unless you take the box down. Or, well, you could get up on a ladder, too. But having identifying information on the outside just reduces the need for pulling these unnecessarily. Um, if possible, an image is also really helpful for um, people who browse visually rather than by number. Um, so just think about, again, who's going to be accessing your collection um, and how you can accommodate them. Okay. So I had a look around for some other kind of specialty supports, and some of them are shown here. Uh, the National Park Service has a whole conservagram dedicated to making saddle supports out of coroplast and velara. So if you have any saddles in your collection, you should check that out. Um, there's some hat supports that I found um, online. There's a lot of storage supports, actually, on the internet, so you can get online and get inspired. Um, there's also a shoe support, and um, just a note about those, if the twill tape, um, if you're using twill tape and it doesn't stay put, um, you can cut a notch in the edge of the blue board, and the twill tape then can sit in that, and it's just less likely to move around and slide around. Um, and there's a kind of sample pattern for that support um, immediately to the right, and then a kind of like mid-folding diagram showing how that's put together. So I'm going to leave
Okay. So hopefully that diagram makes sense. If not, we can we can revisit it. Okay. Sometimes you know it's it's a big commitment to make supports for every object. It takes a lot of materials. It takes a lot of time. Um, so I'm just gonna present a few um, options moving away from supports that allow the object to be handled without direct handling, but that still support the object um, in storage. So you can still make modifications in drawer to or on shelf to prevent prevent shifting. So this on the left is a full drawer insert. Um, with bumpers, and it looks like an enormous pallet, but this is not meant to be lifted. It, it, you, it's too big, and those objects are too heavy, so it's not something that would be uh, lifted out. It's just something that sits in the bottom of the drawer to give you something to attach all of those bumpers to. Um, so now, even though you can't move the objects individually without direct handling, y you can open the drawer with a little bit more comfort, you know, without the objects hitting each other. There's a similar concept on the right, um, just kind of simplified. The whole drawer is lined with velara foam, which I just kind of recommend doing in general to provide some, some cushioning for your objects. In this case, there are slits cut in the foam so that paper inserts can pass through. So it's kind of an illustration of this just above them showing the dotted line is the cut. And the paper just slides through, and those act as separators for the halibut hooks. Um, and then the sides of the drawer are also lined with Volara. Um, you know, it doesn't prevent all movement, um, but it just keeps them from knocking into each other. So a few, a few more storage solutions. Um, backer rod rings um, can help keep objects from tipping over. Um, snake weights are also good for that, and um, just in general for storage and transport, providing um, kind of on-the-fly support. Uh, you can also make your own, which is shown on screen, kind of in the middle of the screen. Um, sealed bags are helpful for isolation in a pinch, you know, if you don't have a designated isolation space, but you need to, to isolate something. Um, but remember that you will be creating a micro environment inside, so it's it's not a, a long-term solution necessarily, like for off-gassing objects, because all those volatiles are just going to get um, cooped up in there. So um, just consider uh, when you use that when you use that option. So um, I know some people mentioned that they have garments and if the garments are pretty robust, padded hangers um, are, a, are an option that's kind of a case-by-case -case evaluation to make sure that your objects can withstand that but um, it does save a lot of a lot of space and um, it can help prevent wrinkling depending on on the material so um, there is a conservagram also from the National Park Service on um, turning a regular hanger into a padded hanger so you don't have to buy special hangers you can make them uh, you can make them yourself okay we're, we're wrapping up the support section. Um, if you need to build a lot of supports and you're trying to maximize your efficiency, um, there are two things that I recommend adding to your toolkit beyond, you know, like ruler and knife. Um, and that is a drafting triangle and also a, a screw punch. So um, there's a couple of diagrams on, on screen and I'm just trying to illustrate um, the different ways that you can use a triangle to, as a shortcut um, to make really quick parallel lines um, with a ruler that's on the left in the left corner and then on the right um, using it to determine how wide a support should be. Um, if you've had to make supports for things like vases or cups or baskets, um, you know, eyeballing from the top trying to figure out how wide it is at its widest part. Um, a triangle just takes the, the guesswork out of that, which is really nice. Um, and then, oh, yes, so ethafoam. Um, ethafoam comes in a in, a, in like blocks and it's pretty expensive so most people cut it down they cut off of the block but only the top and the bottom surface of the like original piece are smooth um, so when you cut into it it exposes rough edges 
So to not be limited um, to just those smooth sides, you can cover rough edges that will come in contact with objects with Tyvek. Um, the diagram here is not my finest, but it's meant to show you that you can make cuts in the side of the ethafoam and then stuff the edges of the Tyvek into those cuts. It anchors the Tyvek without any adhesive and also allows you to get a pretty nice fit. If it doesn't seem like it's working, try making the cut a little bit deeper and you can just use like a, a palette knife or a micro spatula or just anything, you know, kind of flat and not too pointy to stuff the Tyvek in. It's, it's surprisingly effective. Um, let's see. Oh, and if you need to make a lot of bumpers, um, for vases or baskets where you need to find that angle that the side makes with the horizontal. Um, I like to whip up one of these little like paper and Velara, I don't know, angle finders or savers. It's just folder paper, like a folder stock and a little circle of Velara that I've fished out of the whole bunch. Um, and it might seem silly, but if you have to make a lot of this style of support, um, you might, you might come to appreciate that. It can be hard to eyeball. Okay, that was a lot about supports, which may or may not be helpful to you depending on where you are in your um, collections care saga. So I'm going to switch gears now and talk a little bit about some condition red flags. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways, because there's so many materials involved, there's a lot of ways that objects can deteriorate. And um, some of that happens before the object gets to your collection. So it's important to document um, your collection so that you can track deterioration to see if it's getting worse um, while it's in your care because you know a lot of that deterioration is sneaky. So what I'd, I'd like to do in this section is to talk a little bit about some warning signs that you might see in collections that suggest there may be an active condition issue. It is definitely not an exhaustive list so if you're not sure um, I would say take a photo and and contact someone, you know, contact a conservator or um, just anyone you know who might have experience with those collections. The American Institute for Conservation has a find a conservator search function on their website. That's the um, first link on the screen. Um, and then other conservation organizations like in Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, they also have similar um, directories. The Canadian one is the second link there. So um, so don't despair. There is probably a conservator near you, hopefully, or you can email me and I will try and direct you somewhere. Okay, so starting with copper alloys, there are a lot of different kinds of corrosion for copper and some of them are, are helpful like they can create a protective layer that stops the metal from reacting any further with its surroundings and some are added by an artist intentionally um, for appearance for aesthetics um, but some kinds of corrosion are, are not so good and a common place to see unwanted copper corrosion is when it's in direct contact with leather um, similarly um, fingerprints are really corrosive, so um, metals should generally be handled with gloves. But in the case of leather, um, it's just it's there, it's in contact, and the oils and other residues react with the metal to produce a bright green corrosion product. There's a whole range of colors for copper corrosion, especially in the blue and green spectrum. So, um, so so don't panic, but uh, but maybe contact someone who knows their metals. Um, in the meanwhile, stabilizing the relative humidity will help. You can also try to reduce the contact area between the metal and the leather with mylar or some other barrier. In the case on screen, you know, that fastener is in pretty tight contact with the leather. You're not going to be able to totally barrier it. Um, but like, uh, like buttons, um, you might be able to introduce a barrier. So uh, active corrosion can also be caused by polishing residues, if there's a history of polishing um, at your institution, and for archaeological collections, it can come from uh, contaminants from the burial environment, like salts especially. So uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of ways that this can happen, so um, if you start seeing some really vibrant colors, that, that might be an indication to, uh, to investigate further. If you start seeing fuzzy or chalky white crystals on materials that contain calcium carbonate, so um, 
most commonly, I think, seen on shells, that's an indication that your environment is acidic. Um, the acidity could be coming from other collections. I mentioned that a lot of materials have their own kind of off-gassing. It could be coming from wood shelving um, or acidic storage materials. Um, and a conservator you know, should be able to sort out the affected shells, but if you don't address the source of acidity, the efflorescence will just continue or pick up again when you reintroduce the objects to the environment. So this is definitely a, an, act, an act sooner rather than later uh, uh, situation. Okay, um, I have three more, and they're, the last three are unfortunately all due to inherent vice, which is just a term used that there's, it's in the object due to manufacturing or something with the materials. There's an inherent flaw. Um, so without going too much into the history and science of glass making, some glasses are formulated with more alkali than others, and the function of that is to bring down the melting point of the glass. It's um, kind of a necessary component, but if there's too much of it, um, it can leach out from the glass when exposed to repeated uh, relative humidity cycling. So it often starts as clouding of the glass. Sometimes you get iridescence, um, these white crystals um, on the left on that blue bead. Uh, sometimes you'll get the appearance of liquid droplets, which if you pH test them are very alkaline. Um, it'll develop a crack network, um, sometimes called crizzling, and then the kind of last stage is falling apart, uh, which is what you're seeing on the right. So glass disease does give you kind of a lot of warning signs before this last step. So um, take the opportunity to stabilize your relative humidity if you start seeing these signs. Those of you with historic film collections will be familiar with this one, but cellulose nitrate was also used as an ivory and tortoiseshell substitute. So it often shows up in combs, fans, little boxes, and other like historically ivory and tortoiseshell pieces. Um, if you have an object uh, like this one on the right that is showing this characteristic blocky internal cracking, um, get it out of uh, general storage. Um, the object will eventually break down, like the one on the left, but at this point, with just the internal cracking, it's already releasing nitric acid, and that will attack metals, papers, other cellulose nitrate objects, the original object itself. Um, so you'll want to isolate it um, away from the rest of the collection, but you also don't want to seal it, because um, that will just let it like stew in its own juices, and that really speeds up the process. So um, their supports should also allow ventilation. It's kind of this balancing act, um, <clears throat> unless the object is going into cold storage. So as with many chemical reactions, bringing down the temperature and the relative humidity will slow down the process. So um, I would say contact a conservator to get advice on you know, cold storage, packaging options, and also cellulose nitrate monitoring. If you know that you have cellulose nitrate in the collection, um, I would really recommend a monitoring program because cellulose nitrate can um, be fine for a long time and then, you know, I don't know what happens. I don't know if anyone knows what happens. Um, it just starts. So uh, you just want to have that on your radar if you have cellulose nitrate in the collection. So the last one, historic silks um, are often susceptible to embrittlement. Um, this has commonly been attributed to metallic salts used to weight the silk during original manufacture, but when I looked into this more in preparing for this presentation, um, it wasn't totally clear. It seems like there might be uh, some discussion about that you know, kind of ongoing. But mechanism and cause aside, the result, you know, the part that you will see is that shattering silk becomes very brittle. Um, sometimes the thread in one direction will preferentially deteriorate and you end up with these unsupported parallel threads rather than a woven fabric. And obviously that's much more physically delicate um, than you know a, a full textile. Um, the remaining uh, threads are also very brittle. So 
Um, I don't know of any treatments at this time that address the chemical root of the problem, but uh, textiles conservators should be able to provide some physical support to protect the remaining silk. Um, shattering is accelerated by ultraviolet radiation and elevated relative humidity. So those are both things that you can reduce to uh, increase the life of, of these old silks. Okay, so that was that was it. Um, hopefully I haven't put you off objects too much and you feel empowered to build a whole bunch of supports for your 3D collections and um, have a better idea about when it's time to to get some help, maybe reach out to a conservator. Um, that's my email on screen if anyone has questions uh, now or later that they, they want to ask. Um, and we do have time for questions, so let me just have a look. So tissue, I mean, tissue is fine. It's, um, it's more likely to get mashed down over time, um, you know, that the gravity will eventually flatten it. Um, the other, the other concern with tissue, um, it depends on what the object is, but if it's an object that itself tends to be acidic, or it might be making its own acidity, um, I'm thinking things like leather, I think is one. Um, some kinds of wood, actually a lot of kinds of wood, um, they may eventually make the tissue acidic, which, I mean, in that case, the tissue is acting as a, as a sorb, which, which is not a bad thing, but, um, it will start falling apart, uh, and then you kind of have confetti. So it just depends on the object. Um, you could also... Um, maybe switch to batting with a stockinette or like a textile over top to create a kind of pillow. Um, or you could put stockinette or another textile over tissue paper um, so that if you do end up with the tissue paper kind of falling apart, at least it's kind of contained. It's not going to get all over your object. I don't know, did that, did that help, Jane? <laughs> So does anyone else have any questions? We we have some time if anyone thinks of anything. Is anyone um, interested in setting up a support building station? Because I do have um, those extra slides if anyone is is like ready to go, ready to set up a station. All right, let me see if I can bring up those slides. Okay, so this is an example of the kind of workstation that um, I worked at in the past. It basically consists of one of those self-healing cutting mats. Um, and then we just, we had a bunch of, a bunch of equipment, which you may or may not need. Um, I already mentioned the, the screw punch, but we had we had a lot of knives, um, both for foam and for cutting blueboard. Um, as you can see, we used a lot of blueboard. So we had box cutters. Um, uh, this kind of it says the blue looking funny knife is actually a coroplast ripper. Um, I think maybe if you put in a big order of coroplast, you might have the option to get one of these too. It just um, Sorry, I should say coroplast is a plastic corrugated board, fluted board, and um, it's difficult to fold if it hasn't been cut into. And so that kind of knife just cuts through one side of one flute that then lets you fold it along that flute direction. So that's kind of like a funny gizmo to have. Um, and uh, I think the next slide, yes, has the toolkit. So we use scratch awls for scoring. Some people just use a knife and press gently. I really liked the scratch awl personally, and, and you can get those at hardware stores. Um, uh, micro spatula, which is not on screen, I mentioned um, it's good for stuffing, stuffing tool tape. I mean, sorry, stuffing Tyvek into your ethafoam uh, blocks. 
course, erasures, bone folders, we talked about um, the triangles. And actually, sorry, I'll just go back a second. Um, I was just going to mention about glue guns. <laughs> Um, having glue guns in collection areas is is kind of stressful. Um, so you just want to make sure that you have a really good system for making sure that those get turned off. Um, if you have the means to invest in a higher quality glue gun that is less likely to burn you or anything else, um, I would say that's a sound investment. Um, so you know you you can get glue guns for really really cheap. Um, and if if you do that and they're the kind that just like fall over immediately, you might want to fashion some sort of stand for them. Uh, and uh, let's see. If you go through a lot of supports, um, you'll find that you'll find uses for almost any size of scrap. So I also like kept all of my scraps until the very end of this rehousing project. Um, and if you make a tray that's the wrong size, um, just hold on to it because eventually an object will come along <laughs> that is perfect. So, all right. Well, if there's no more questions, I guess you guys can can head out, and um, I'll be available. I'll hang out for a little bit, and just let me know um, if you want to email me. And the slides will be available on the website after. Oh, so sorry, I should mention this Care of Objects links. Um, that's just a list of um, kind of helpful sites. You know, I mentioned the museum handbook. Um, there's a link to it in there, the National Park Service. Also, the Conservagram for making saddle supports and a few other places. Um, so, uh, so download that if you um, are interested in getting more information on anything that was presented here. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Have a fantastic rest of your day.